Perfect. So I see a few folks trickling in. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are so excited to have you here with us. My name is Tisha Tan. I am a Community Outreach and Education Coordinator here at Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, or TRCA, and I will be facilitating the program tonight. Uh, TTP Talks is a free speaker series all about Toronto's urban wilderness, TTP, or Tommy Thompson Park. And as part of TTP Talks, each virtual event that we host will cover a different topic related to the park. So this evening, our talk will be focused on creating habitat for wildlife at Tommy Thompson Park. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'll get started uh, with a few housekeeping notes. If you are joining the webinar on a mobile device, you can um, swipe between the slide view and the webcam view just by swiping your finger across the screen. So if you can only see my slides, um, if you swipe on your screen, you'll be able to see the webcam of the, the speaker who's speaking. Everyone here has been muted to limit their background noise, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. So if you have any questions, you can throw them in the Q&A box. Um, there should be a Q&A button where you can put your questions in. We will answer these questions during the live Q&A session at the end of the talks. You should all be able to see other people's questions that are being asked, and you can upvote questions that you like. That will allow us to prioritize um, the questions and, and prioritize their order when it comes time to, to do the live Q&A. So feel free to do that. Also, um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we are happy to share a link to the recording in a follow-up email once we've uploaded it online onto the Tommy Thompson Park website. So um, be ready for that. And if, uh, if you have any folks in your lives who might be interested in this topic but are unable to join us today, there will be an opportunity for them to, to view the recording once we've got it posted on our website. All right. And so to start, even though we are all geographically dispersed in this online environment, I would like to begin by recognizing that wherever we are, we all work, live, and gather on traditional Indigenous territory. Now, when we do a land acknowledgement at the beginning of an event like this, it's an opportunity for us to take a moment and reflect on ourselves, reflect on our relationship with the land, as well as our own intentions for gathering here today. And so I hope we can all take this moment together to reflect on these things. As part of this reflection, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the lands that Tommy Thompson Park and TRCA are situated on are traditional territories and treaty lands, in particular those of the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as the Anishinaabeg of the Williams Treaty First Nations, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also want to acknowledge that these lands are also the traditional territories of many non-human living things who have equally been impacted by the arrival of settlers on Turtle Island. We must remember that we share this land and all of its gifts with these living things. And in line with our topic for this evening, um, I hope that we can all reflect on our shared responsibility to give back to the land as much as is being given to us on a regular basis. So through our work with land and water resources within the greater Toronto region, TRCA appreciates and respects the history and diversity of the land. We're really grateful to have the opportunity to work and meet in this territory. TRCA is also grateful for the continued work of many indigenous peoples who are the original caretakers of this land. And we humbly acknowledge our responsibility to respect indigenous perspectives and elevate indigenous voices. And so with that, I invite you to acknowledge the Indigenous territories and treaty lands in your local area, wherever you're coming from this evening. If you'd like, you could do so in the chat. Or if you would like to learn more, we encourage you to explore the interactive map at native-land.ca. So let's start by going over the agenda for this evening. We'll start with an introduction to ecological restoration, and then we'll go into some of the restoration projects that have taken place at Tommy Thompson Park starting with aquatic restoration, then wetland creation, and then finally terrestrial enhancements. At the end of our talks, uh, we'll have a live Q&A session. So please don't forget to answer your questions, uh, enter your questions in the Q&A panel as they come up throughout the course of the evening so that we can address them at the end. 
We have a great lineup of speakers joining us this evening. Our first speaker is Karen McDonald, who will be giving us an introduction to ecological restoration. Karen is a senior manager on the ecosystem management team and has been working at TTP since 2003. Speaking second will be Ralph Toninger, who is the Associate Director of the Restoration and Infrastructure Division here at TRCA. And this evening, Ralph will be speaking to us about aquatic restoration at TTP. Andrea Creston will be speaking to some of the wetland creation projects that have happened at the park. She is a senior project manager on the ecosystem management team and has been working at TTP since 2007. And our final speaker this evening is Hilary Stead. Hilary is an environmental technologist here at TRCA and has been working at TTP since 2017. And she'll be reviewing for us the terrestrial enhancements at the park. So with that being said, I will turn things over to Karen to start us off. Thank you, Tisha. Okay, I've got my screens in order now. Uh, thanks, Tisha. So the importance of ecological restoration. Well, first we need to figure out what ecological restoration is. Restoration is the act of repairing what has been lost so that the system has a positive trajectory, returning it to the way it was or repairing it so that it adapts to a new situation. Enhancement is improving ecological function, and that can include biodiversity, food web interactions, nutrient cycling, the ability of the landscape to adapt to climate change, hydrological services such as flood and erosion control, etc. And it can also involve creation, which involves new ecosystems, also called novel ecosystems, which is largely what Tommy Thompson Park is. But for the purposes of tonight's webinar, we'll be referring to all three terms with the same intended meaning, that the ecosystem is improved and made resilient. There are three inherent goals to undertaking ecological restoration, to restore biodiversity, to restore function, and to restore connectivity. At TRCA, the foundation for successful ecological restoration is focused on hydrology, soils, and natural cover. If those elements are, are in place, we find that wildlife responds to it, and TRCA does not reintroduce animals onto the landscape. We take a build it or restore it and they will come approach. But why bother doing this at all? Well, human activity is now so intense across, across the globe that many of our ecosystems are now threatened. In fact, we're now in the fourth year of the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. A recent paper estimated that by 2050, 95% of the planet's land will be degraded. And with the loss of that ecosystem with, with degradation comes the loss of the ecosystem function. Things like clean air, clean water, and climate regulation, things that we depend on for our survival. And economically, the success of our society is closely tied to e healthy ecosystems, and the continued loss of our and degradation of our ecosystems is estimated to cost the global economy about $10 trillion by 2050. Another very compelling reason, though, especially for tonight's audience, for undertaking ecological restoration is that nature and wildlife depend on healthy ecosystems. Tommy Thompson Park is an excellent example of how intentional habitat enhancement projects can result in remarkable improvements for nature and wildlife. As a constructed landform, the spit initially lacked natural habitat entirely. If you were at our first TTP talk creating Toronto's urban wilderness, you will recall that it was once a barren landscape made of mostly bricks, rubble, and harbor dredge. Aid. The 1992 master plan provides high level guidance on habitat enhancements by community type, for example, dry meadow versus wet meadow. But really, the Natural Area Enhancement Plans provides the additional detail on plans that TRCA and partners made to enhance aquatic and terrestrial habitat at Tommy Thompson Park. The Natural Area Enhancement Plan was developed by TRCA, as well as an advisory group of experts, including the Tommy Thompson Park Natural Area Advisory Committee and the Tommy Thompson Park Advisory Committee. I'm not going to dive into the details of these plans here, but you'll hear about some of the 
some of the enhancement projects that TRCA has undertaken from my fellow speakers. But before we do that, we need to cover, cover a couple of other relevant initiatives. The first is that Toronto and region is part of an area of concern. This is a federal binational designation to indicate the environmental degradation of the area. The Toronto and region area of concern extends along the north shoreline of Lake Ontario from the Rouge River all in the east all the way over to Etobicoke Creek in the west. It covers about 2000 square kilometers and includes six watersheds as well as the Lake Ontario shoreline. The Toronto Region AOC was designated in 1986 because a review of available data indicated that water quality and environmental health were severely degraded. The Toronto Region Remedial Action Plan was developed and this lays out actions that can be taken to improve our environment and eventually de delist the AOC. And you can see on the slide some of the improvements that have been made going from 1987 when we had a total of eight beneficial use impairments to now we're down to only five. This is positive. And the reason to mention the Toronto area of concern is because right in the middle of the waterfront is what we like to call a biological center of organization. The Don River watershed, the Portlands, the Toronto Islands and Tommy Thompson Park are located in the general area of what would have been the historical Ashbridge's Bay Marsh. And from the last TTP talk, we know this was also a major waterfront development area which would have contributed to the degradation of the area. Today, with the imminent completion of the new Lower Don River project, along with the existing great habitat at the Spit and the Toronto Islands, this area of waterfront is positioned to become an incredible success for Toronto's waterfront. And linked to the Remedial Action Plan is the Toronto Waterfront Aquatic Habitat Restoration Strategy, or what we like to call TWARS. TWARS provides practical information to help decision makers, restoration practitioners, and regulatory agencies about aquatic restoration on the waterfront. It includes three major elements, and that is the synopsis of existing physical processes, cultural influences, and aquatic communities. The compendium of habitat restoration techniques, which we use all of the time and really is the bread and butter of the strategy and habitat plans that matches habitat restoration techniques with appropriate physical and biological conditions across the waterfront. And to tell you more about aquatic habitat, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Ralph Toniger. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> um, I assume everyone can hear me fine. So yes, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit further uh, about uh, aquatic restoration. And very specifically, um, I want to go back to that context uh, that Karen brought up. And if you were part of the first webinar series um, that talked about the Ashbridge's Bay Marsh Complex, historically, um, this was really one of the most significant um, and most productive uh, um, coastal marshes on the north shore of Lake Ontario. I have a bit of an image here. So if we keep... Um... Sorry, Ralph, it looks like we lost your, your lost your screen share. Oh, that's strange. Let's try that again. No problem. All right, looks good. Looks good again? Okay, perfect. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so yeah, if we uh, look at the the image here of Tommy Thompson Park um, in relation to Toronto Islands, I'm going to bring a figure in here that represents roughly about the 1800. Um, and we see Toronto Islands, which uh, at this point, we have the Ashbridge's Bay Marsh Complex here and the Toronto Islands. Um, Back then, the islands weren't actually islands. They were connected to the land base and were a spit. And there's a long history, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But really now, with the work that's at Tommy Thompson Park, really to bring 
aquatic habitat, coastal marshes, natural shorelines. This area was really the engine that drove the nearshore fish community. And that really is one of the overriding um, factors that we've been, um, that has really led to the planning um, for this area. And, and I have to really put this site in context um, with the Lake Ontario and the, and the, the entire lake. Um, lake Ontario is really a giant um, bathtub, really. It's a fairly, you know, oval, uh, deep water system. And we see, we'll zoom into this area here where Toronto is. Um, and we will actually... Um, take a closer look at some of the unique features of the Toronto area. So here we have a shot of the spit um, and the Toronto Islands area here. And I'm looking at this transect right here. So we see very deep Lake Ontario. Um, and then this is this relatively shallow water area. When we look at the cross section, it's what jumps out is what's known as the Toronto scarp. Less than a kilometer off the tip of the spit, we see a massive deep um, or, or large, almost a uh, escarpment like the Scarborough Bluffs. But this is, of course, much deeper water. So this is really a cold water, um, what's known as a pelagic fish community. Salmon, trout, um, alewife, uh, sculpins, things that are really cold water. And we see this almost an island of, of warm water habitat. Um, and this really in this area, the Spit and Toronto Islands are really the, the engine that drive that fish community. And we see a lot of um, fish communities uh, like the, uh, the salmon and some of the deeper water communities that come into this area. And, and this area is a vital important area for, uh, for not only the, the near shore uh, fish community, but also the, um, some of the cold water deep species. Another thing that I really have to put in context, and I think many of you may have uh, seen uh, some of these images before in some other talks that we've given, but Lake Ontario is also a large lake and it its water levels fluctuate widely. Um, we actually see here, this is a graph of the historic water levels in Lake Ontario. And we actually see this red line across here, which is the 100 year average. And typically in design work for shoreline work, the 100 year average becomes an, an or has historically been an important um, depth to really plan what's happening with the water. What is the typical water levels? But we do see um, water levels greatly uh, fluctuate up and down. But the one unique feature is because of really low levels in the um, roughly the 1930s and then again in the late 50s and early 60s, um, which really drive shipping to a halt because of those low water levels, points where the, the sh ships couldn't even go through the channels that in 1960, they completed the Cornwall Dam, which really stopped um, these low water levels. We now control water levels in Lake Ontario, and we still see a lot of flexibility or a lot of variability, but what we don't see are the lows. And it's really the, lo the lows that have destroyed our habitat and, and is what we really need to restore essentially aquatic vegetation or emergent vegetation from the shoreline. And, and that's the thing that we're always having to battle. Um, and Karen sort of brought up that idea of, are we restoring or are we creating or or are these novel ecosystems really we we always have to deal with this um, altered hydrology and so we are now we've understood this much better and are using this as some of the key design criteria to help drive um, the work that we do this is a, another stylized graph and then i promise i'll get to a lot a lot more pictures but um the this is meant to be a stylized graph showing um plant growth in the lake um and ideally emergent vegetation we see you know typical growth happens from late spring to early fall that's when it's warm enough and it's sunny enough for plants to grow there is a, a depth you know aquatic vegetation if the water's too deep then uh, uh, plants can't grow. And if it's too shallow, then it turns terrestrial. So this blue band and where the green and blue intercept is where it is prime uh, growing conditions. And the dotted line represents a natural system or what Lake Ontario used to be. It would typically be highest right after spring melt um, in the late spring um, and into the early summer. And then water levels would typically drop over the course of the year. And really then this area here, this prime growing area 
over the course of the year, you would see more and more um, um, land exposed to growth. And we had tons of growth. What we truly see because of water level um, control for shipping, water peaks out in the middle of the summer during high fi- uh, shipping traffic. And it only drops into these low areas outside of those seasons. So we actually see prime aquatic growth only happens on the end. So we get a a uh, short period in the spring where it's great for aquatic vegetation growth and a, a period in the fall when it's the water has already dropped. But um, at that point, typically we see senescence. And we really have to think about this as we design and plan our shorelines um, because uh, as we've learned, aquatic vegetation is truly the key to the success of, our, uh, uh, of the work that we do. One other factor that uh, I wanna talk about here, and while it's not the sole problem, it's it falls into this uh, this um, triad of, of uh, things that we have to deal with within uh, Lake Ontario um, is the biotic factors, you know, in this case, common carp. Common carp are um, an invasive um, exotic species that was brought in from Europe um, and their numbers have proliferated throughout the Toronto waterfront and across Lake Ontario. Carp directly feed on vegetation, which in this red arrow represents it's a negative impact on vegetation growth. Carp also stir in the shallows and, uh, and, and cause the water to be highly turbid, which um, the turbidity itself reduces uh, the ability for plants to grow. Um, because of these you know, manipulated water levels, we, uh, um, and, and in lack of uh, vegetation, we see unstable sediments. Um, so those carp, again, can, uh, when there's, when there is missing vegetation and, and submergent vegetation, then the carp would cause even more turbidity. Um, and then throw on these high water levels um, and manipulated water levels at their highest in the spring when it should be dropping down. All of this um, works together to really, again, be another strike against aquatic vegetation. And it's something that we really need to keep in mind um, as we, we do this work. And you see the video that's uh, playing here. Um, you know, these are common carp trying to go into our cell one wetland. Um, and we see a massive biomasses uh, or a, ma- a massive biomass of common carp here trying to um, um, get into that wetland through their, their bioturbation and through their, their, their just physical um, consumption of the vegetation. Um, we, we, we uh, it was really limiting vegetation and and uh, by by excluding them from these areas we've seen a proliferation of of, uh, of the vegetation we're actually even seeing reduced reproduction or reduced recruitment in uh, carp populations and they're naturally dropping in those areas as well so uh, um we'll get into some of the projects and things here as karen um highlighted we you know uh spent a lot of time in the mid uh, 2000s um really targeting um you know through our we had our uh our toirs or our toronto waterfront aquatic restoration strategy but very specifically for tommy thompson park we developed a aquatic uh, habitat enhancement plan and this really looks at the various areas um, based on their typology open coast habitat which we'll, we won't talk about tonight but will definitely be part of a, uh, some of our later series um, but where i want to focus on is some of these sheltered embayments and coastal wetlands so the the interior cells um, cell one two and three embayments a b c and embayments d these are were are really excellent prime opportunities for uh, enhancement work and uh, as we sort of talked about with lake levels um this is well Wetland restoration and shoreline restoration, you know, if you want vegetation to grow and in- include habitat, um, it's a fairly simple process if you understand the water depths. And there's been a ton of work around uh, shorelines and how to create an ideal shoreline to get this beautiful transition. This is what we would love of all shorelines that where we have, you know, riparian vegetation moving to emergent, moving to uh, um, transitional or submergent habitat. And, and this really is, is what naturals, uh, the natural uh, shoreline was typically like. And we know those ideal depths where plants can grow, but again, looking at those graphs earlier of, of the, the water depths being high and low and, and uh, you know, are they at the right depths at the right time? Or are we seeing, as we have seen for the last few years, record high water levels that drown the vegetation. And, and this is 
what we've actually typically seen, this red line coming in here at the bottom represents sort of what we see because of the natural processes. We don't typically get these natural shorelines. We get right at the at the sort of the, the high point here because of wave action and bioturbation, we actually see about, you know, uh, 25 to 30 centimeter um, edge. And I'm sure if you've walked along the spit, you see those areas where the the willows just sort of abruptly stop and then you get that little deep water and there's we're missing that aquatic vegetation and then these areas um, are quite deep and we typically don't see in the our natural shorelines the um, significant um, aquatic vegetation in these areas and this is exactly what we are trying to re remedy as part of our shoreline work. Um, and um, as Karen mentioned in our tours, we've looked at a lot of these scenarios and, and there's great experts that do this across Lake Ontario to create, you know, we're looking for these large bands of emergent vegetation with deep water pockets, great places for fish, amphibians, a variety of, of, of habitats to create um, hemi marshes, you know, in places the wood um, and, and the, the structural habitat. This is what we really want um, in natural shorelines and what we've been really focusing on as part of our restoration since truthfully about the late 90s. Um, first off, um, and before we talk about more on growing, uh, I, I do want to talk about water temperature as well because this is a critical piece and that scarp that I showed you originally um, at the beginning of the presentation, the in our embayment areas here, we see, because it's so close to this deep water, we get these things that are known as cold water upwelling events, where when the conditions are right um, and the wind may be blowing to the, to the north, um, we see um, water turning over it and we can take an embayment like this. And that's what this, these lines are here. These are a series of uh, temperature loggers that are mapping um, or are recording water temperature um, from roughly from June to um, uh, December. And we see water temperature st steadily rising. The green line is truly a temperature logger out in the open embayment and the black line represents a te temperature logger in the shore. Uh, here. And this is embayment B, one of our very early, one of our first restoration projects, really before the enhancement plan and before we really understood these ideas around uh, lake level fluctuations. Um, and the idea was to close some of these areas off to make them warmer and make them more productive. That was the thought anyways. But what, we're actually, what we actually saw, and, and here's a perfect example, it's sort of the beginning of September, we see one of these cold water upwelling events. So the green line, we see water temperature going from almost 25 degrees Celsius, dropping down to roughly about six degrees Celsius over the course of about three days. And people have seen this actually happen over the course of 24 hours. That is too quick for fish to uh, react, this being a warm water fish nursery, those become killing um, temperatures. And even though this area was isolated, we the, the black line is showing the temperature uh, in this backshore area. Really, the, the, the backshore area is still following pretty well that same temperature drop. And it is, um, um, in, in those cases, we can actually see huge mortality and especially newly hatched fish that really don't have a place to escape. So um, this is one of the first uh, bits of uh, large scale work that we did in embayment A. So embayment A up here, very, very similar um, featureless shoreline. We surcharged or um, filled and recontoured the shoreline to create those typical grades that we're after, added a ton of woody material, um, log structural habitat. Um, we see this is actually um, much later after the work was done and, and uh, the trees and everything is maturing. But this type of shoreline work was really targeting fish community and looking for those warm water uh, refugia as they're known. And here's the same sort of temperature logger. We have the green one out in the open um, embayment here and the black one in the hidden back shore area here. And this is that same time period where we saw this dramatic cold water of, um, upwelling event. And we saw the open embayment drop, but generally big fish are out there. They can find places or they'll move closer to shore. But in this situation, we didn't see that same extreme drop in the backshore area. It only dropped 
to roughly about uh, 12, 13 degrees Celsius. And there was only a temperature difference um, of about three degrees. So the in these situations, this is what we're after. This, um, this vegetation, and it's really the vegetation that is holding these fish community and preventing that cold water from turning over. Um, this applies to um, embayment D as well, and uh, I'm just going to finish up with embayment D and then lead this into the coastal wetlands um, discussion component. Embayment D is this, what looked like an ideal embayment, perfect depth um, between um, uh, half a meter to at, at places um, more than a, a meter, um, but for years and years, and almost 30 years, this has been prime for aquatic vegetation growth, but we've never seen more than a little perimeter of vegetation or, or, um, around the edge. And you see this aerial shot here, this should be just completely growing and it just never had. We tried planting it, we tried uh, uh, quadrats to um, exclude um, carp, which we knew were very dominant in this scenario, but we ultimately came up with our embayment D uh, um, coastal wetland design, which we were really turning this sheltered embayment shoreline into more of a coastal marsh habitat, um, isolating it uh, with a berm and uh, one of those fish and water level control structures, a series of barrier islands that we had always hoped could be potentially colonial waterbird habitat, but also a variety of structural fish habitat and deeper water habitat around the outsides, and then with some contouring the inside to really create those uh, situations. We implemented uh, this work in partnership with, uh, at the time, the Toronto Port Authority, now Ports Toronto, and truthfully, um, it has surpassed our greatest expectation. Um, these same areas, just by isolating this work uh, and, and controlling fish access, we've seen a proliferation of not only emergent, but submergent habitat. And I'm sure for anybody that goes down there, the, the, the fish and wildlife habitat that have uh, benefited from this um, are truly impressive. A bit of a shot of uh, one of our staff, actually, that's a fisherman in Dakot, uh, this northern pike, right off the outside where we created pike habitat, specifically targeting that species. Um, unfortunately, beavers have also found this place very attractive, and we have been struggling a little bit with uh, um, the beaver clog clogging up our our uh, carp gate and our, our fishway here, a shot here of, of the beaver completely damming it up. Um, they seem to be able to move more earth than our, our heavy, heavy equipment uh, operators. Um, but we have implemented uh, a beaver baffler that uh, appears to be working quite successfully um, to really maintain that, um, that access. Because one of the important aspects of embayment D here is really the connection to the open water lake and providing that fish nursery habitat, but then also providing um, access to the lake for its later stages. And this is now one of our most productive coastal wetlands. And I will turn it over to Andrea now to uh, talk about a little more specifically about our wetland restoration work. Thanks, Ralph. All right. Okay, so. As we've already spoken about um, multiple times, so I'll make this brief, um, Ashbridge's Marsh was a really important feature on the landscape at the mouth of the Don River. Um, with the loss of Ashbridge's Marsh, we also lost a lot of biodiversity. We lost the flood protection and, um, and it really changed the, the landscape, obviously. So the opportunities that we have at Tommy Thompson Park are really important. Now, as well, um, in, coastal wetlands are incredibly important. So in general, wetlands reduce flooding, they filter air and water, they can absorb carbon dioxide, and they provide really important habitat for wildlife. Now, coastal wetlands specifically um, are like all wetlands a lot on, on the landscape, um, but they're located on lakes. And as Ralph described, the water levels are directly influenced by Lake Ontario. So when we have, you know, those really high, high water levels and the low water levels that are unlike a natural uh, situation, it can impact the coastal wetlands. Now, an opportunity that we had at the Leslie Street Spit is confined disposal facilities. So 
As we discussed in the previous webinar, um, the confined disposal facilities were constructed in the 1980s um, as a result of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So these three confined disposal facilities that we're showing in the photo here are um, three landlocked bodies of water. They're used to store um, dredged contaminated material that comes from the Lower Don River and the Caving Channel. So this material, because it's located at the mouth of a very highly urbanized river, um, the sediments themselves um, have uh, contaminants that are chemically bound to them. Um, so, so like heavy metals, um, hydrocarbons, you know, things that had run off into the river and they get bound to the sediment particles and sediment flows downstream and accumulates at the mouth of a river. So you've probably heard of a, a delta. So that's a shallow area, area at the mouth of a river. Um, it's shallow because the sediments accumulate there. So in the situation at uh, the mouth of the Don River, we need to uh, dig out the accumulated sediments so that we can maintain uh, boat passage. And so unfortunately, because these, uh, these materials are contaminated, we can't dispose them in open Lake Ontario as we would have done um, 50 years ago. So um, these three confined disposal facilities are the sort of forever home for these contaminated materials. So we have cell one, which was the first one to be filled um, at the very uh, north end of the park. And if my laser pointer, this one up here, um, it was filled to capacity in 1985. Cell two is slightly larger and was filled to capacity in 1992, I believe. And cell three is this bigger cell down here. Um, it's uh, double the size of the other two um, uh, confined disposal facilities. And it is still an active confined disposal facility. Um, so you'll notice uh, sometimes when you come visit the park in the summer, the pedestrian bridge might not be available for pedestrian use. And that's because that's the sort of doorway for the, um, for the barge and tug to get into cell three to dispose the, of the sediments. So these sediments are sort of contained within these water bodies and they're gonna stay there forever. Now, they, when the filling um, happens, it's done to a uniform depth. So this doesn't provide ideal habitat for fish. Um, there's also um, very little aquatic vegetation. The shorelines are very, very steep. Um, they're rocky, rubbly, um, but they drop directly into the confined disposal facility. And there's no in-water structure. Um, so there's, there's really very little um, habitat available for fish and wildlife in these, uh, in these confined disposal facilities. As well, um, there's also open access for common carp and um, and yeah, <laughs> so um, the confined disposal facilities um, provided us a really unique opportunity. Um, so back in the late 1980s, as we were undertaking the Tom Thompson Park master planning process, um, an idea came about to create a wet cap um, to cap the cell one confined or to cap the confined disposal facilities. And we started with the with cell one. Um, and build a wetland at the surface. Now, this was a novel approach. It hadn't been replicated anywhere else. Um, typically, um, a dry cap might be put on and, you know, some sort of um, recreational facility, a sports field, or um, sometimes uh, parking lots are put on uh, former confined disposal facilities. But the approach TRCA was taking was to create habitat. And so um, because this was a new idea, it took many years of research, planning, experiments, and permitting to ensure that it was a feasible undertaking. Um, so this, this took, I don't know, like 15 years um, before permits were in place to actually move forward with the project. So as part of the detailed planning, um, we looked at the landscape examples of wetlands. What do wetlands look like? What kind of features do they have? We, you know, this process was undertaken as part of the Toronto Waterfront Aquatic Habitat Restoration Strategy and those restoration techniques were developed and they were applied to the cell one wetland. So everything was planned before construction began. 
And so this is what the confined disposal facility looked like um, in 2002 before any construction began. So this is cell one, um, it's 20 years ago. Um, these three platforms here are common turn uh, nesting platforms, similar to what we see today in embayment B. Partway through construction, um, you can see in this photo that the cap is being installed. So when I talk about a cap, I'm referring to a thick layer of sediment, um, so typically clay or silt, that is not a porous material. So it creates a barrier between the contaminated sediments below and everything else at the surface. So as I mentioned earlier, the contaminants are actually chemically bound to the sediments. So they're not mobile, they're not floating around. So by capping, by putting a lid on those contaminants, we're able to biologically and physically isolate them from the surface. Now also through the capping process at the, at the very top of the cap, we're able to contour and create the physical conditions on the landscape that would be a wetland type environment. And I have some more examples later, but this is what cell one looks like today. Um, so we have a, a very lush, um, productive wetland. So in terms of habitat features, um, we use a lot of the similar habitat features across our restoration project. So we always make sure to include a lot of structural complexity, both in water and on land. Um, so if you're looking at any of our restoration projects, um, the Cell 2 wetland is a great example. Um, you'll see a lot of wood material. So you'll see logs sticking up out of the water. Um, you'll see them sort of laying horizontally in the water. And there's even logs under the water. So all of these logs provide different types of habitat um, for wildlife. So the logs that stick straight up out of the water provide perching opportunities for birds. Logs that are floating sort of horizontally in the water provide perching opportunities for birds, but they also provide basking opportunities for turtles. We also use a variety of stone sizes, um, primarily below the water, uh, below the water surface. Um, and these provide um, all sorts of different micro habitats. So you'll have all sorts of if you're looking at the food web, the base of the food web is little microorganisms, and little tiny insects that larger insects are going to eat, and those are going to be eaten by larger wildlife, so birds, fish, mammals. And so we need to make sure that there's opportunity for all of those different components of the food web to thrive so that we can have a healthy functioning ecosystem. So different little, like different sized stones, the spaces between the stones, um, cracks in the bark from um, an old log that is uh, submerged provide those tiny little microhabitats. Now, additionally, um, the stones can provide um, have fish. Uh, they can serve as uh, spawning shoals, um, and they can also provide um, feeding opportunities and shelter. Um, in the, in the photos that we're looking at on this slide, um, you, we can also see on the right one, I'll use my cursor, this structure here is what we call a fish crib. And so this is an assemblage of all of those different types of features. So we have logs that are making our log cabin type structure, and then it's filled with different types sizes of stone, as well as different types of woody material to create those uh, a varied habitat. So moving along um, in terms of um, the wetland design, we also designed to have deep and shallow areas um, to provide habitat for different plant species as well as different wildlife species. We've integrated islands um, into the design. So some shallow sandy islands um, to create opportunities for turtles, um, nesting birds, um, more uh, rocky shallow islands for common terns. Um, We've also focused a significant amount of effort once the construction component is complete and we have the landscape contoured and these structural habitat features have been implemented, then we plant, we plant it. So we use native wetland species and riparian plant species to really bring the wetland to life. Um, so 
The challenge is, uh, of course, that as Ralph was explaining, that the water levels in Lake Ontario are much higher during the peak growing season, which makes it challenging to establish young emergent aquatic plants. So these are plants that grow in shallow water, um, but they and they require certain depths. So if the water gets too deep, it can drown them. So part of the carp exclusion um, we have water control, fish and water level control structures that we integrate into, we'll call it the mouth of the wetland. And these structures have bars in them so that common carp can't access the wetland while our native fish can. Um, and this is because common carp have a very uh, bony facial structure. And so their, their, um, their cartilage flares out towards their gills. Um, and they, they can't pass, they can't squeeze through the bars. And so they're excluded, whereas the, um, our, our top predator species, so largest uh, fish species like um, northern pike and largemouth bass, um, can squeeze through the uh, water control structure uh, or the fish uh, gate bars. And of course, it's a water level control structure, so we can put stop logs in so that we can manage water levels in the coast wetlands independently of Lake Ontario. So um, this allows us to keep the wetlands, especially in the first couple years after we've built them, we can keep them isolated from the lake so that we can manage the water levels to ensure that those uh, emergent aquatic plants that need the lower water levels have those and that they can fully establish and then once they've established they're a lot more resilient to fluctuating water levels in the future um, and then another thing that we install um, because of course there's it's a it's a blank canvas when we start um, we install nest boxes and so we target on uh, sort of on the aquatic side of things um, you may see uh, wood duck boxes in, in some of the wetlands. And so the intention behind these boxes is to uh, compensate for the lack of old growth trees. Um, as I said, it's a brand new blank canvas. So although we've planted trees and shrubs that will eventually grow large and provide cavities for cavity nesting species, when the wetland is brand new, we don't have those. Those trees are, are just a couple years old and are, are quite small. So um, providing opportunities for a variety of species is the name of the game. Now, we won't get into too much detail. Cell 2, the Cell 2 wetland is immediately south of the Cell 1 wetland. Um, we constructed this wetland about 10 years after the Cell 1 wetland was completed. Um, and we had learned um, some really important lessons and some additional science had been um, conducted uh, in the water, uh, along the waterfront, um, sort of between the completion of Cell 1 and the beginning of Cell 2. So we made a few design um, modifications uh, to the Cell 2 wetland. Um, in this northeast area, um, we've added uh, it's, it's much shallower in this area so that we can have a lot of continuous um, emergent aquatic vegetation. And when I say emergent aquatic vegetation, I'm talking about things like cattails, bulrushes, um, and, and those sorts of plants. So the tall, tall plants that you see growing in the wetlands at Tommy Thompson Park. We also, um, and this is the monitoring that happened on the waterfront, there was a lot of fish monitoring that happened in uh, like around 2010. And results from the, this study indicated that there were fish um, that like to overwinter in the cells at Tommy Thompson Park in really deep pockets. And so with that knowledge, we were able to um, incorporate deep areas and some connectivity between the deep, air, between the deep areas um, so that fish have the opportunity to um, survive and overwinter in these wetlands. We've also included an amphibian pond up in the northwest corner of the wetland. And so this is an isolated body of water um, so that there's essentially there's no fish in this wetland, which provides a safe refuge for amphibians to breed as the fish aren't eating their eggs after they've been laid. And of course, um, we included a significant amount of structural habitat. Now I'm just going to flip through um, a series of Google Earth images. Um, this is cell, uh, cell 2, and this is in October of 2014, um, just before we started the restoration project. 
By May 5th, 2015, um, we've begun the um, filling process. So we've closed off this section of the wetland and we're, we're creating more sections so that we can put the cap in place and fill it. And here it is May 22nd. So we're making a lot of progress. July 10th of 2015, um, we've got more access cells and you can see the cap is being placed in all of these areas. Uh, November 7th, 2015, we're still making progress. And in some of, it's a little bit hard to see with the cloud cover, um, but here is maybe a good example. Um, you can see some lower depression. So this is where we were simultaneously, at, as soon as the cap was placed, we were uh, grading and creating the habitat conditions. And here we are in December of 2015, and we were pretty much complete by April of 2016. At this point, cell two is hydrologically isolated from cell one um, so that we could do, we could place the cap without disturbing the wetland habitat in cell one. And September 2021, it's a functioning wetland. Um, it's still in the process of establishing vegetation. It takes many, many years for the aquatic vegetation to establish, not to mention the extremely high water levels we had in 2017 and 2019, um, which required constant pumping to try and keep the, the water levels in cell two much lower than, than the lake that year. Um, now, quick side-by-side -side shot, pre and post restoration. Well, not fully post, we're still in the process of establishing vegetation. But not. And I just wanted to touch upon um, our aquatic planting. Um, so anyone who's visited the park and has seen our wetland creation projects or a, I guess a recent restoration project that we've undertaken will notice a significant amount of fencing in the wetlands. And we have to put the fencing up to protect the plants when we plant them. So as you can see in this photo here, the plants are really small and they're quite delicate um, when, when we plant them. Um, and this without protection is essentially a buffet for waterfowl. Um, so if we were to plant, um, plant a couple hundred plants in a day and leave it unfenced, at the end of the day, the ducks are going to come over and they're going to eat the plants and, and the plants won't survive. Because when they're this young, they need the opportunity to um, grow roots and grow stronger shoots before they're resilient to herbivory or being eaten by wildlife. So we fence them off um, to exclude um, waterfowl from, from the nodes and we keep the fencing up for a couple of years until those plants have established. So establishing means growing a really substantial root system below the surf, below in the uh, in the sediment, and uh, and also producing a seed bank. Um, so it'll take years for plants to drop seed, and we need the seed bank so that um, so that the plants can regenerate. Now we've also been in terms of the plants. Um, we've been subjected to some challenges um, in our wetland restoration projects. Um, a big challenge is invasive species. And so we've managed, uh, we've successfully managed Phragmites, and we're still in the process of, of keeping it under control, but we've made some excellent progress with managing uh, Phragmites australis, or common reed, um, in our wetlands. Um, and purple loosestrife is another one. Um, it was quite prevalent in the early 2000s, um, but there is a biological control. Um, it's a beetle, and it usually keeps the population sort of in balance. Um, and, but in a the past couple of years, we've seen a resurgence in purple loosestrife. Um, and so we have, uh, we're, we're releasing, we released some uh, beetle larvae last year um, to, to sort of push back that population and allow the native vegetation to, um, to reestablish and, uh, and provide a healthy uh, system. Now, I'm not touching upon our Phragmites management today. Um, we will touch upon that in a future webinar. And finally, the bread and butter of why we do wetland restoration. Uh, it's for wildlife. 
um, or one of the reasons we do wildlife. And we've had really great success um, with uh, wildlife, creating habitat for wildlife at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, so we have a variety of turtle species um, that are very successful at the park. Um, we have northern map turtles, we have snapping turtles, um, we have painted turtles. Um, there's an abundance of painted turtles throughout the park. Um, there's so there's a variety of turtle species, and there's some species that are um, sort of larger lake species that will uh, pass through the park and use the habitats um, on their on their longer journey. Wetlands and Tommy Thompson Park are synonymous with birds. Um, so Tommy Thompson Park is a key biodiversity area. It provides essential habitat for birds throughout all seasons of the year. And we've really seen a, an excellent increase in the number of species and diversity of birds that are um, not only breeding at Tommy Thompson Park, but passing through and using the wetlands. Um, so we're going to showcase a few species here today, uh, but the list is almost endless and uh, it's a lot of good news stories. Um, so for the past 10 years, we've had trumpeter swans that have been nesting in almost all of the wetlands at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, we also have um, colonial water birds. Um, so common terns are nesting on the platforms in Bayman D, as well as currently in cell three. Um, so this guy is a, is a common tern and uh, is interacting with this great blue heron. So great blue herons don't nest in the park, but they are a regular visitor and uh, they, uh, they, they use the wetlands um, for, for hunting and, and roosting. Um, we have also had um, some other um, significant species that have nested in our wetland habitats. We've had records of least bittern nesting um, as well as um, some other, um, my next slide, some other waterfowl species. Um, we have wood ducks, um, which are these guys over here are nesting on pretty much an annual basis now. We have canvas back ducks um, and of course there's mallards. Um, this photo was just um, super cute. I wanted to share it. Um, these, this, you know, demonstrates um, how wildlife um, use the wetlands. These, these little ducklings and, and the, the mother mallard are snacking on um, insects that are flying in the air. Um, so we, I focused a lot on, on water birds here and waterfowl, um, but there's also a variety of songbirds um, that benefit from um, the wetland systems at Tommy Thompson Park. And, uh, and it, really, it really contributes to the success and the opportunity for these birds to be successful. Now we also have mammals. Um, Ralph alluded to our friends, the beavers in the embayment D wetlands. Um, so our strategy to um, coexist um, both with the beavers and provide habitat access for fish in embayment D with our, our custom, uh, our beaver baffle on that water control structure. Um, but we also have um, records of river otters using Tommy Thompson Park. There's a population of muskrat and American mink. And a lot of these species are very sensitive to ecosystem um, or to, to degraded ecosystems. They require high quality habitats to survive. And a lot of these species weren't present on the Toronto waterfront for, for many years. And so through the restoration initiatives at Tommy Thompson Park, as well as through the remedial action plan for the greater Toronto waterfront, um, we've increased the, or we've significantly improved the environmental conditions to the point where these species are returning to the landscape. And as Karen mentioned, TRCA is creating the habitat to support these species. These species are arriving on their own. Um, so we haven't we haven't imported any of these. Um, they we put out the habitat and the wildlife come to make use of it. Now the other community, um, and I might be missing a couple. Um, I haven't talked about frogs or toads at all, but um, insects um, have also benefited greatly from the wetlands and the restoration that we've undertaken at Tommy Thompson Park. Um, there's a huge diversity of dragonflies and damselflies um, that are um, 
that are seen around Tommy Thompson Park and in the wetland communities um, throughout the summer. Um, so just a, a very small sample here. Um, this is a meadowhawk uh, dragonfly. This is a uh, whitetail dragonfly. And these down here are the damselflies. Um, this is um, an eastern forktail, and this is a familiar bluet. Now, along with our wetland restoration, um, our work, um, we also conduct a significant amount of environmental monitoring, um, specifically in the in the habitats around Tuckahoe Park. Um, so, on an annual basis, we conduct marsh monitoring, both for amphibians and um, marsh birds. We undertake emergent um, aquatic vegetation surveys um, in the wetlands and coastal uh, in, and sheltered embayments. Um, we track um, our invasive species so that we can prioritize management. Um, we've undertaken breeding bird surveys with the support of the Tommy Thompson Park volunteer naturalists. We do fish community monitoring. We also undertake sediment and water quality monitoring in the cell wetlands. And every 10 years or so, we undertake ecological land classification um, to document changes in the vegetation communities across the landscape at the site. Now, I've gone on for quite a while. Um, so I'd just like to wrap up by saying that um, overall, the aquatic environments at the park now function as a wetland complex. So this includes the wetlands. Um, I didn't mention all of them, but there's Triangle Pond, Cell 1, Cell 2, and Embayment D, as well as the sheltered embayments A, B, and C. And so all of these, um, these, these aquatic environments uh, function as a wetland uh, complex, and the species easily move between these unique water bodies to undertake their various life stages. Now, if we loop back to Ashbridge's Marsh, the work that we've accomplished at Tommy Thompson Park has been, we've been able to restore some of the ecosystem functionality that was lost on the Toronto waterfront following the filling of Ashbridge's Marsh about 100 years ago. With that, I would like to pass it over to Hillary so that she can talk to you about the terrestrial work that we have done at Tommy Thompson. Thanks, Andrea. All right, so we've learned a lot about um, the aquatic habitats of the park, but I'm gonna to talk to you about terrestrial habitat now. So terrestrial simply just means on land and terrestrial habitat restoration at the park has focused primarily on protection, enhancement and re rehabilitation um, of meadows, shrublands and successional forests so far. And something to note is the habitat type or terrestrial habitat type of the park is very dependent on the materials that were used in specific locations during the construction. So for example, the sandy silty peninsulas of the park support the forest habitat. However, trees struggle a bit more to grow in areas where um, construction material like brick and rubble were used for the construction. Um, in terms of restoring, enhancing, or creating habitat or terrestrial habitat at the park, a variety of restoration techniques have been used, including landform alteration, drainage design, soil conditioning, and then as Andrea mentioned, um, we actually go in and plant um, to create diverse communities and diverse ecosystems. So to date, over 30 hectares of terrestrial habitat have been enhanced at, to, at TTP and over 400,000 stems have been planted. And this includes trees, shrubs, wildflowers and grasses and the aquatics that Andrea mentioned are also included in this statistic. Um, we try really hard or we, we insist on choosing species that will not only grow and thrive in the harsh conditions of the park, um, just based on the, the base of that they're trying to grow in, but also species that are native and typical to the area or typically should be growing in this area historically. So white pines are an example. So why is terrestrial habitat so important? Terrestrial habitat provides um, many benefits to us and the wildlife that use it. Um, so it provides shelter and cover for wildlife like small mammals. Um, the vegetation in these habitats provides food sources to our wildlife, so seeds and berries. Um, various bird species rely on the terrestrial areas for nesting. These areas help drain and filter surface water, and they provide shade for wildlife and windbreaks to interior areas. 
Now, an example of terrestrial habitat at the park is an area known as the Neck. So as you can see, um, it's the north end of the park. Um, and this area was enhanced by diversifying the elevations and moisture conditions um, by bringing in different types of soil. And today it's dominantly meadow habitat. Um, the eastern edge was also planted um, strategically using native tree and shrubs to try to, to act as a windbreak from the strong gusts that can come off of Lake Ontario. And these then protect the interior areas that were seeded and planted um, with native grasses, wildflowers, flowers, and shrubs. Um, if you're in our last webinar, um, you heard me talk about the importance of meadows. Um, and this area is one of those areas, the important areas to um, pollinators, but species at risk like the monarch butterfly. Um, so Tommy Thompson Park has been registered as a monarch way station since 2010. Um, and this just means that it has over 5,000 square feet of meadows. And these areas provide essential habitat um, for staging, breeding, and nectaring. Now, jumping south in the park a little bit, um, another example of terrestrial habitat is an area known as the toplands of the park. Um, so a little bit different of a design, although it now um, consists of about 12 hectares of mixed meadow and thicket habitat. But the design of this area was um, designed to allow for natural hydro hydrologic processes to play take place using various slopes and elevations to try to create an ecosystem of vernal pools and diverse um, vegetation communities. So as you can see on this image, there's a little series of pools. And the idea is that um, they fill with water seasonally. So vernal pools are pockets um, that seasonally are flooded in the spring and they flow into each other. And these are really essential habitat for amphibians such as frogs to breed in the spring. Um, we've also gone into this area um, once it was filled in and added, added habitat structures, um, as Andrea mentioned, to create little microclimates and microhabitats. Um, and they also provide opportunities for wildlife to hide, nest, um, den, and perch. Um, something else to note is this area was seeded, but it was also planted with native species. Um, and it was planted strategically to create nodes and corridors. So um, we added conifer nodes, um, so clumps of a vegetation type to try to offer more habitat for op opportunities for um, overwintering owls. Um, and then when I say corridors, I mean um, linear areas of vegetation type so that wildlife can move um, through the area with cover. Um, today, the area has um, grown into be dry meadow, meadow marsh, and thickets. So here's just some construction photos of the Toplands project. So as you can see up here, it was just a fill site as the rest of the spit was. Um, these are some of the elevation um, considerations that were used in the design process. So the areas will fill with water and they'll flow into another seasonally. And this is what the area looks like now. So fully vegetated, um, it's, there's some shrubs, some trees, but it is mostly meadow thicket habitat. And this is it from above. So, um, the lighthouse is just down here. Um, and this is the top lands area that I'm referring to. So um, while enhancing habitats, we also include wildlife specific features and some of the terrestrial examples um, will include snake harbor vernacula. Um, so these are areas for overwintering snakes. So they're depressions or pits um, in the ground and they're below the frost levels and they're then filled with like rocks, gravel, logs and they create cavities and snakes will enter the hibernacula and go into a state of brumation until the spring. Some of the species of snake that we have at the park include milk snakes, garter snakes, and decays brown snakes. Um, as Andrea mentioned, we use um, bird boxes. So some of the terrestrial bird boxes um, are smaller for target species like um, tree swallows. We also do have um, some owl nest boxes at the park. Again, because the forest is fairly new, we don't have a lot of natural tree cavities. Um, so this is tried to mimic those nesting opportunities for the birds. Um, 
in relation to that, we also have three roosting boxes for bats at the park. Um, so same thing, um, bats will roost in tree cavities, but we don't have those yet. Um, so these have been designed to provide maternity roosting habitat for native bat species, including the little brown bat, the big brown bat, and the northern long-eared bats. Um, log tangles or habitat piles are placed throughout the landscape and when you're walking through the park you'll see them pretty much everywhere. Um, so we, we pile logs and different types of stone um, and these provide shelters for animals and can act as perches or dens for different wildlife. And then along some of our shorelines we've also um, included nesting habitat for our um, turtle species. So turtles will nest along the shorelines in a sandy gravelly material. Um, specifically, they prefer to be south facing so they get lots of um, direct sunlight. So we've strategically created these mounds um, for our different turtle species. Now, let's see if my, I'm not sure if uh, this is going to play for me. <laughs> Not a problem. I'll share my screen for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, should be playing. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to summarize, um, along with our partners, TRCA has invested over $7 million in habitat creation and enhancement projects at Tommy Thompson Park since 1995. And as we've discussed today, this includes over 40 hectares of aquatic habitat um, through the sheltered embayments and wetland restoration, as well as over 30 hectares of terrestrial habitat through meadow, shrubland, and forest enhancement projects. So thanks to all this work, coupled with natural succession, Tommy Thompson Park has developed into a globally significant key biodiversity area and an environmentally significant area that supports a variety of wildlife species, including species at risk. And with that, I will pass it over to Tisha. Great, thank you so much, um, Hillary. And, and thanks everyone um, to all, like a significant thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their knowledge with us today. It's one thing to, you know, attend a talk to learn about some of these um, really cool restoration projects, but it's totally another thing to hear from, you know, such a skilled panel of, of experts who've been so involved in these projects at Tommy Thompson Park, a park that is so special to so many of us. So thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing their expertise with us this evening. With that being said, we've reached the Q&A portion of our agenda this evening. Um, so if anyone has any other questions that they would like to ask our speakers, please feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. I also do have the chat open as well. So if any questions sneak in through there, um, I'll be able to, to pass them along. Um, our first question, I believe, uh, came about um, from that really strong image that Ralph shared um, in, in, in his presentation with all of the carp kind of collecting or bottlenecking at the carp gate. And so James would like to know if um, that collection of carp bottlenecked at the carp um, gate is used or leveraged as an opportunity to remove them. Uh, perfect. Great. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the question. Um, we do actually work closely with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and uh, also a number of other angling groups um, in the past. So there's a few things that are going on with carp. We are not capturing them um, at, at those points, um, but the, um, the Ministry of Natural Resources at other locations are doing or have been doing that in the past um, and, and doing uh, removals. Um, Truthfully, it seems like a massive amount of carp, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to what's actually out in the lake. Um, the Ministry of Natural Resources and, and also some of the local angling groups have also been um, 
promoting um, a carp fishery. Um, and uh, actually, it's quite common now to see people fishing for carp um, as a method to uh, um, um, continue to remove them. But um, what we found is those large volumes um, were there in the early years, but we don't see those numbers as much uh, now because carp try to return to the place they were born. Um, and now that carp are being excluded, uh, we don't see those large masses like we did in the early years. I would imagine if we did see some of those large masses, the park would be swarmed with carp anglers. So <laughs> easy pickings there. Thanks for thanks for that thoughtful answer, Ralph. Um, another question has come through in the Q and A, um, and maybe I'll direct this towards Andrea. How long until the final cell of the confined disposal facility is filled to capacity? So I believe this is in reference to cell three. Yes. So cell three is significantly larger than uh, both cell one and cell two. Um, so at this point, there's still several decades worth of capacity um, at current uh, dredging rates. Um, so we don't anticipate um, that it will be converted to a wetland anytime soon. Thanks, Andrea. And I guess as a follow-up question, Julia would like to know if you if you know where the dredget would be placed once it's been filled to capacity. No, that's a long way in the future. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, there's a question here. I think is is um it's a really thoughtful question. Is the mild winter that we're experiencing currently, plus the lack of ice, plus the low water level, of concern of the park? Maybe I'll start with this question, um, but there's there's uh, you you ask a very loaded question because uh, a lot of it we can say we're not sure. Um, but um, going back to our points, one of the key issues is is uh, we put a lot of thought and effort and worked with all of our partners around the 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 work and we this idea of like uh, Andrea summed up, you know, it's a wetland complex. It's not one project, it's not one bird box, it's not um, that they all function together and, and we're trying to create functional systems that will be resilient and have, um, you know, uh, where, there's, where there's refuges, where there is alternate habitat. So our, our primary uh, thing is that we're hoping to build habitats that make them naturally resistant to these, um, these oddities because, uh, you know, High and low levels have always been part of, of nature. Um, you can go species by species. Generally, low snow cover and, and uh, um, is is bad for a lot of uh, things that are um, um, nesting um, or overwintering at ground level. Uh, small mammals, you know, uh, metal voles, a variety of things like that snow cover and need that what's actually called a sub subnivian layer, that area where the snow touches the uh, um, the, um, the ground. Um, it also, when you get cold snaps, then you get really heavy frost that can freeze the ground and cause um, um, a winter kill of some of our um, um, young plants and even uh, um, uh, creatures that are attempting to overwinter. If, if we get a real long cold snap now that uh, um, we, we may get um, killing um, uh, um, 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 frosts or freezes to some uh, vegetation that even in these this crazy warm spell like we had today, we'll, we'll see possibly some budding and things happening. Um, and in many cases, um, ice low ice cover in some of the embayments and some of the small pockets are not always a bad thing for fish um, because it does allow for better um, oxygen um, transfer between the air and the water. Um, quite often really heavy, heavy cold years with thick ice cover, um, we'll see uh, winter die off of fish. And we have seen that at uh, TTB before where we've seen a large uh, dead carp in the spring um, because of uh, really thick ice cover. So it's a it's a tough question. Uh, depend, pick a species, you know, it, it is change. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else from the, the panel wants to add anything. I'll jump in, Ralph. Um, you're I think this question is coming to people that have a lot of climate change anxiety. And so, <laughs> yes, it, it makes me nervous about things. But one of the things you mentioned, Ralph, that is actually a positive in many cases is um, whenever we get those really cold temperatures, like minus 20, minus 30, 
those are killing temperatures for some species that we actually don't want around. And so um, things like um, a spongy moth, for example, uh, that really uh, can decimate our, our, our forests for a period of time. Um, when we get cold temperatures, they, they end up killing those eggs off. And when we get these mild winters, that makes, um, you know, folks like <laughs> me and my team that deal with invasive species I'm much more nervous about what's coming up yeah i'm sure our staff would be happy if we had um if the ticks got knocked back with some really cold winters as well <laughs> thank you ralph and karen for for answering that loaded question and you know as a follow-up um, there's a there's a there's a question here related to that about how how resilient is the current state of Tommy Thompson Park to these climate change questions or or effects. I know Karen, you had alluded to you know that maybe these questions are coming from a, a place of eco anxiety, um, but to your point earlier, Ralph, you were talking about how and actually all all of you were talking about how these these projects are are meant to build resilience in Tommy Thompson Park. So maybe let's put a positive spin on things and discuss how we feel about the resiliency of of Tommy Thompson Park due to these these um, projects and I, I think I'll open the floor to all of you to to share your input I can I can start um I'd like to draw attention to the flooding years um, so 2017 and 2019 when we saw record high water levels in Lake Ontario. Um, so there was extreme flooding, um, both at you know, Toronto Island Park uh, experienced uh, significant flooding, um, but any location at Tommy Thompson Park that where the land was at an elevation lower than what the water level was at was uh, submerged. Um, so essentially all the peninsulas um, were underwater for a period of, I think it was about three months. And so at the time, we were quite concerned about the vegetation communities, the terrestrial vegetation communities, um, these tree species that were probably not tolerant to water um, or standing water for that uh, period of time. And so we watched closely to see what happened um, post flooding. And I think the results were promising. Um, the native tree and shrub species are thriving. Um, and the, the biggest impacts that we've seen, um, and it's quite noticeable in Peninsula D, is um, the impact of the water levels to uh, the European birch. Um, there was a significant amount of European birch growing on Peninsula D, um, and it did not tolerate the, uh, the, water, the high water levels at all. And pretty much every single European birch that was subjected to flooding conditions um, has died. Um, so to the point where, you know, we're monitoring it closely to ensure that we don't have hazard trees um, along the trails on Peninsula D. Um, so it's changed the canopy a lot, but that is like in terms of the ecology, I'd say that was one of the only major impacts that we saw following the, the high water levels. Anyone else have anything to add to that? The only thing that I might <clears throat> add further entry is uh, um, as a result of those high water levels, uh, the shorelines that um, really don't have those natural um, gradients and some of the shorelines that we haven't yet implemented works, um, really, we, we saw a lot more uh, of that erosion, um, you know, some of those areas along the, um, the tip of uh, um, embayment or Peninsula D and, and we, we um, where, where we don't have um, some of uh, those natural um, in environments. Um, and again, uh, yeah, I think that, like we sort of said with our earlier question, the, um, um, if we knew today, as we are building this this uh, landmass, um, or if we were building this today with the knowledge um, that we have today, we would build this very differently because uh, um, these shorelines were built to dispose of uh, rubble material and um, for, uh, originally uh, for some potential, um, um, you know, uh, or for the some of the aquatic uh, uses um, that. The, the way those shorelines were put in place, uh, we didn't understand those larger lake processes. Um, and uh, um, I think there's still a lot of work to do to make this site more resilient, particularly with, uh, you know, these record high water levels. And um, we, we didn't sort of mention, but that, I um, mean, the shot that's on the screen there, that those that uh, eastern 
um, shoreline get some of the largest wave action in all of uh, Lake Ontario because it has some of the largest fetch. Um, and there are definitely some areas that still need work. Thanks so much, Ralph. And thanks, Andrea, for, for sharing that, you know, there there is some reason to to have to have some hope and, and to to it's it's great to see that um, you know, that that positive evidence that that um, you know, the the ecology of TTP is is able to, you know, be resilient to some of those changes like flooding, as an example. Um, I might pivot to a different topic now before things get too heavy. Um, there's a question here about turtle hatching at Tommy Thompson Park. So Hillary, did you want to um, share some of your experiences with, with turtles hatching at the park? Yeah, so we don't have um, specific tur turtle hatching events. Um, what we do have to monitor turtles is we have a volunteer program where um, a team of volunteers will go to the park at different times and just Monitor, monitor turtle nesting. Um, so volunteers will um, patrol areas that we know there's um, an abundance of turtle species. Um, and if they see a turtle nesting, um, they actually will put a turtle nest protector structure on top um, to protect the nest from predation so that hopefully um, they can, uh, can hatch successfully. Um, so we do have that turtle program going on but in, ter in, in terms of an actual hatching event um, not specifically. All, all right thanks so much Hillary. So yeah if you if you're interested in getting involved in that um, volunteer opportunity I think you can reach out to um, our, our general TTP website or e uh, email address to, to learn more and I'll have that those details uh, in a follow-up email as well as on the next slide. Um, there's a question here from Vicky. Are there any plans to expand the land mass in future? And I might throw this over to Karen to answer for us. Well, there actually is Vicky, and um, in the next year or so, um, stay tuned for another public information center that we will be hosting with our partners at the City of Toronto and Toronto Water to talk about the new Ashbridges Bay land form that has been created sort of adjacent to and a little bit in front of Tommy Thompson Park. Most of that land mass is going toward Toronto water infrastructure, but actually about two hectares is going to be officially moved into Tommy Thompson Park. And we're going to be having a public meeting to talk about that land and uh, the restoration and the trail alignment on there. So stay tuned later this year. That's great news. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, and then I think this might be our last question for the evening from a familiar name. Um, Brian wants to know, is there still enough surplus concrete rubble available to maintain the exterior shorelines? And I'll throw this over to Ralph to answer for us. Perfect. And uh, leave it up to our old boss to answer the, or ask the tough questions. And uh, and for the uh, sake of some of our, our other uh, participants tonight, I, I would single out our question from Brian, our past CEO of T TRCA and, and part of TRCA for 30 years um, and definitely um, we wouldn't be here talking about Tommy Thompson Park if it wasn't for some of the leadership work that uh, people had a long time ago before uh, we were all part um, of, of this. But um, great question. Um, truth is the, the climate has completely changed. We compete for rubble nowadays. Um, and we feel bad at times because uh, the rubble recycling, one of the largest rubble recycling plants is literally across the road um, and uh, um, on uh, on Unwin Avenue. And um, we we have seen a massive drop in the amount of rubble. Um, a similar project, the Lakeview project that we worked with uh, Credit Valley Conservation Authority um, in uh, right at the edge of our jurisdiction. Um, we when we built that landform with Credit Valley, there was such a shortage of rubble. We had to be very creative in what we used for shoreline material, and we actually um, did do a scenario where we used a lot more um, softer sediments um, behind sort of a rubble wall. Um, so we are in the process of uh, we've been working with our partners, uh, doing a lot of study on this shoreline to um, understand the final. Um, 
um, design of, of this. Um, but currently, there is not rubble being dumped on this site. Um, and um, there truthfully wouldn't be enough. We really want to look at um, some of the novel approaches, um, some real exciting work that we've done with uh, over at uh, Gibraltar Point, looking at offshore reefs um, to help um, in the, the final shoreline protection of this. Um, but yeah, I hope that sort of answers your question, uh, Brian. And uh, um, if we can find some, uh, you know, send it our way, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Ralph. And with that final call to action, um, I just want to say thank you again so much to everyone who joined us this evening. If you have any follow-up questions um, that you'd like uh, to send our way, you can direct them to ttp at trca.ca. Also, a uh, reminder to keep an eye on your inbox for a follow-up email. Um, our follow-up email will contain a link to the recording once it's been uploaded that you can share with anyone who may have missed this evening's webinar. And we'll also include a short feedback survey. I also want to mention that we'll likely include some information on how you can support similar projects happening at Tommy Thompson Park right now. Some of the amazing things that were highlighted by our speakers today are only made possible because of funding grants and donations from folks like you. And so I hope you feel inspired to contribute to this important work. Um, with that being said, um, this wraps up our evening. Our next Tommy Thompson Park um, webinar or TTP talk will be happening later this spring on April 30th. And the topic will be all about birds. Um, birds are a really important part of the ecosystem at TTP. And we're excited to dive a little bit deeper on that topic at our next webinar. So keep an eye on the Tommy Thompson Park website for more details. And we hope to see you at our next TTP Talks. Thanks so much, everyone. And have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.